Well, hello, and welcome again to the 2012fad.com. I am your host for this evening, and my name is Charlie Bluehawk. Last night, we talked about as the world changes. We talked about how literally, on a daily basis, whenever I leave my little room, a little flat where I'm uh, renting somewhere in Europe, and I walk outside, and the streets change. There are walls where there were not walls. There were parks where there were not parks. And how everything is the same, but slightly different. And how now, the last four years of my existence since fleeing the United States and entering into yet another nightmarish, hellish existence, which you all are now following, I truly can't have sympathy for you because you weren't there for me and I, I just don't feel any need to be there for you. Um, I spent the last 40 years being there for you and uh, you ignored everything I said then. You're ignoring everything I say now. But for the perhaps one or two out of all of you who might have the financial wherewithal to say, yeah, I'd like to survive and gee, Charlie's telling me the truth. Maybe I should talk to him. Drop us a line. Because the, uh, the phrase that I haven't used since the United States, we can all work together for a common cause, we can all prosper, we can achieve anything together. I don't use that phrase anymore, except here on this program, because in the United States it marked me as a fool, and weak and stupid, and someone to be uh, used and thrown away. And then after, uh, it always seemed to be the same, after three months of them trying to uh, rob me and steal from me and get everything out of me and then throw me away like I was nothing. Then they finally realized that no, I wasn't a pushover. I was actually a brick wall. And they took my polite behavior and my courtesy as weakness. And then they realized um, I wasn't weak. And I was just trying to be polite and work together. And they had no place to go after trying to rob me for three months. So I'll say it this last time, and then I'll never say it again. So tonight, speaking of as the world changes, tonight I thought we would chat about worlds within our world and how we, what we think we know about the world we live in just isn't so. And this is beyond the masters. This is beyond um, exterminating all of us. This is beyond their pact with Satan. It's, it's really truly earthbound. It has absolutely nothing to do with our masters. Isn't that a nice change? But again, if we knew that there are worlds within our own worlds, that would upset the master's agenda yet again because we would realize that there's more to our world than the masters let us see. And if we don't see this, what else are we not see? Now for me, thank, thank the goddess I have never seen a flying saucer because, frankly, I don't think I could deal with any more weirdness, to be honest with you. Never met a little green man. Again, infinitely grateful. I think if I, as I've told you before, if you see a flying saucer, turn and run. Just run away because it's not going to be a good thing. If you see a flying saucer, I'll say it one more time. If you see a flying saucer, turn and run you run for the hills, you grab whomever you can, and you just run and don't come back. Because if you see a flying saucer, it's not good. Now that said, I have had one instance that I know for a fact where I had what they call missing time, which usually is related, sadly, to a flying saucer event. And it's very clear in my mind, because I'm, I am a creature of habit, and so I actually vanished from the earth, apparently, for one hour. And to this day, truly have no explanation. This was way back when I was working on this real estate project out in the desert of Southern California. And it was a multi-million dollar project. And I was actually working for the tool guys who you know, said, yes, Charlie, come be family. And that, of course, didn't work. And I ended up actually being, uh, as I always do, I was doing dozens of different jobs. I was doing real estate sales, I was doing landscaping, I was doing um, plumbing, 
and ended up being the housekeeper for these two old guys. So I was just doing everything. So anyway, one of these two old guys uh, was hospitalized. He basically went into his uh, doctor for a checkup, was amazingly healthy his entire life, and basically his doctor killed him. But before he died, he was in hospital for months and months and months. And where I was in the desert, there is a 5,000-foot mountain. You drive up the mountain, very sheer cliffs, and then drive down the other side of the mountain, you're at the ocean. And then you drive up the coast, a um, place called uh, Newport Beach, California, Southern California. And I would pick up his girlfriend at her house in a place called Costa Mesa, again, suburb of Newport Beach, which is, uh, which is south of Los Angeles take her to visit her boyfriend. We'd visit for like an hour. She'd then take me to lunch. I'd take her home, and I would drive down the coast, back up the 5,000-foot mountain, down the other side into the desert, go back to my housekeeping duties, and do this the next day. So it was a routine. And it's a routine we did every day, month after month after month, seven days a week. And just before I was about to leave the house in the desert, I would call this guy's girlfriend. She was 60-something. And I was telling her I was leaving when, you know, we confirmed, and that's fine. And I would jump into my little Spider 124 Fiat. And the uh, most fun in the world I've ever had in my life is driving my 124 Fiat Spider. You know, it would drive for three days, and then it would break down. I'd have to fix it again. Luckily, there was a full garage, auto garage at this house. So don't tell anybody. I used to be an automobile mechanic. I worked on Fiat Spiders and Cadillacs. When, that's quite a combination. So anyway, I would call uh, this little lady, say, I'm on my way. I jump into the, the 124 Fiat Spider, zip up over this mountain, 5,000 feet up, lots of hairpin turns. I was doing like 70, 80 miles an hour. <laughs> I'm a Southern California driver. I'm very fast, but I'm, I used to be really good. And driving like a crazy man, I'd be spinning through these hairpin turns and, you know, looking down, you know, over the edge and just a sheer drop of thousands of feet. Didn't bother me at all. And then I would arrive at his girlfriend's house, pick her up. She was, frankly, afraid to drive, and I didn't really blame her. And as I said, we'd take her to the hospital, spend an hour just visiting the old guy. Uh, again, she'd take me out to lunch. Uh, always a very nice place. She was very wealthy. And I'd take her home and drive back up the coast and, you know, over the mountain, back to the desert, and day by day, months and months and months. So it was a routine. So on this one particular day, I did everything I always did. I got ready to go from the desert house. I called his girlfriend, got into my 124 Fiat Spider, zipped up over the mountains, never stopped, no traffic that time of day, nothing. Got onto the coast road, drove up to the girlfriend's house, knocked on the door. There was his girlfriend. She answered the door. She looked at me very puzzled and very confused. She says, where have you been? And she was really torn. She was very worried about me. At the same time, she was very concerned about being late for the hospital. And I said, I had no idea what she was talking about. She says, you're an hour late. I said, no, it can't be. She, she pointed at the clock, and there was this really fancy clock that she loved dearly. And sure enough, I was an hour late, because it was right in front of the door. You could see, as you walked in the little apartment where she was living, she used to have a, a house in the harbor worth millions of dollars. And she never bothered to buy the land that the house sat on for like 40 years. And when she could have bought the land for $14,000 from a thing called the Irvine Company, the Irvine Company basically owns all of the earth in Orange County, again, south of Los Angeles. So by the time she bothered to get around to buying the land, she couldn't afford it anymore, so she had to leave her custom-built house. And so she was in this little apartment in Costa Mesa. But anyway, she had all this very expensive stuff. And as you walk in the front door of her apartment, you can look across the room, and there's this very fancy, ornate clock, which always kept perfect time. And I always looked at it when I walked through the door. And I'll be damned. I was an hour late. I hadn't done anything different. I followed the same routine that I had done seven days a week for the last God only knows how many months. But I was an hour late. 
So there is my example of missing time that to this day I have no explanation and honestly, I don't want to know. <laughs> I truly don't want to know. You know, thankfully I didn't actually see any flying saucers, so I don't have to deal with that. I, I, le I later learned that that part of that mountain range had lots of experimental high-tech testing grounds, including a nuclear-powered rocket testing ground. And apparently it was the basis of a lot of uh, southern... We had continuous sonic booms in Southern California for years that no one could explain. And nobody could point to. No one understood it, but it seemed to originate from that mountain range. It was also a national park, and also a tremendous amount of um, marijuana fields were planted up in the mountains, so uh, there was always gunfire. And when I was working on the house at the foot of this mountain range, at the foot of the national park, forever bullets were whizzing over my head and that of my dogs. And that was the first time I realized that when a bullet travels through the air, it spins. And that's because it was you could actually hear the bullet going over your head. And I got used to it. You know, it's amazing how fast you get used to things. So I just made a quiet, sort of a silent deal with myself and whoever it was shooting the guns. And I said, okay, shoot over my head all you want. But the moment, you know, I see a bullet hit the ground or you shoot near one of my dogs, I'm getting a gun, I'm coming to find you. Thank God that never happened. So yes, it was very instructive. But yeah, very, again, Southern California, creepy place. I don't recommend it. And so to this day, frankly, as you know, I try so hard to ignore what I see around me. And if I did fly, see a flying saucer, I'd run, because I knew it would not be good. You know, and I see buildings appear and disappear. I see streets change every day. Um, I've actually seen computer programs that I use every day and that I have not upgraded. I've actually seen them rewrite themselves as I'm using them. That has, you know, other explanations. But, you know, I, I can't deal with anything else. I really don't want to. And, of course, you know, there's always ghosts, spirit guides, who I don't really mind, because when I was back in the States, I would encounter them on occasion, and they'd ask very politely if they would, you know, if I would pass along a message to someone who was still alive, a relative, and they just wanted to let, you know, their loved one know who was still in this world that they were okay. And I never mind doing that. I mean, you know, I was just helping people, and everyone that I ever delivered a message to was just so happy to get the message. So that was a good thing. Didn't mind that. And it happened once in a while. No big deal. But since coming to Europe, since meeting the tr true loves of my life, my soulmate, one of them, you know, coming to Europe and being told, you know, my, I would have my, finally have the real job of my life, Honestly, I have been inundated by dead people. Angels, spirit guides, uh, I don't know. I just, I don't think much of them. I just call them the dead people. And you know what dead people like to do? They love to talk. And they never stop talking. It's really amazing. I mean, I used to avoid cemeteries back in the States because all dead people do is talk. And they talk about their lives over and over and over again. Now, the freshly dead, you can have a conversation with. I don't recommend that either. While the longer dead are just sort of recordings. They're like messages. Um, it's, it's like their whole life was imprinted on their physical body. And they're gone. But the message just keeps replaying over and over and over again, like an answering machine message. The really long dead are quiet. You know, they're gone, they've run out of things to say, I guess the tape finally wore out on them. Thank goodness. But here in Europe, ever since encountering my soulmate, and again, I, I highly recommend if you ever encounter anyone you think is your soulmate, just turn and run and never stop running, because frankly, it's not pretty. It's actually quite horrifying. Ever since that, I meeting this woman, I have been swamped over by dead people, and these people are, are these dead folk were really pushy. And they actually managed, and I still don't understand how they managed to do this. They could actually yank me physically when I chose to ignore them. And I, I mean they actually physically could yank me, and I mean hard. Like I was a puppet on the end of a string. 
So they actually, it was like they grabbed the string and yanked it, and I would actually jerk up like I was a puppet. And it was really something. It was really quite disturbing, and uh, especially disturbing when I was walking down the street. <laughs> you know, that's all I need, you know, to look even more strange and bizarre than I already do. And, you know, I mention all of this because I have heard of, but thankfully, again, never encountered, things that I, I, I couldn't even imagine. For example, I have heard the stories over and over again of fully formed, perfectly designed human beings, full grown, but they're only 10 inches tall. I, when I was working in Tennessee, I was in Nashville, actually I was in Smyrna, Tennessee. No one knows where Smyrna is, so I just say Nashville. I heard of a cemetery in Tennessee that had hundreds of graves of these little people, people who averaged 10 inches tall and were fully formed, perfectly formed adults. And some have been dug up, and yes, they were perfectly formed adult human beings, and they were only 10 inches tall. So, just for the fun of it, I wrote the local county recorder's office. And the lady there very kindly told me that I was nuts, and so I forgot about it. And then a few weeks later, the same very nice lady at the county recorder's office wrote me again. Apparently, she had taken my request seriously, and she went looking through old archives. They weren't in the computer. She had to go in the physical archives, you know, old newspaper clippings. But apparently, she found records that there were graves of these little people who were 10 inches tall. A lot of the records were missing, quite obvious to her, but, and that all the graves had been moved, but there was no record as to where. So she was very annoyed, but interesting, interested in the whole thing. She found it fascinating because she found something. You know, but then I, at the time I had other problems. You know, it was 2007, I had been lured to move to New Zealand, and so I left Tennessee where they'd actually offered me a job with this big international company. They would have given me a brand new car every year. They would have bought me a house. But I went to New Zealand. Don't, don't go to New Zealand. Back when I was in Los Angeles, a friend of mine swore to me and she was a native of a place called Pasadena, again, another suburb of Los Angeles in Southern California. She knew and was common knowledge to all of her neighbors of a place on the mountainside where if you put a ball in the road, on this mountain road, the ball would roll up the hill. And to her, it was no big deal. She'd grown up in this place. She never found the time to actually show me where the spot was. But she was one of these really no-nonsense women. She was black and a single mother, and she was very businesslike. And if she told me it was real, it was real. Would not doubt her in the slightest. You can look it up on the web. Pasadena, California, balls rolling uphill on mountain. You know, do a keyword search. At the same time, do a keyword search on um, Death Valley in uh, the United States. And they have rocks in Death Valley that sail across the sand, leaving trails behind them. I've seen the pictures. I don't particularly care for the heat, so going to Death Valley doesn't thrill me at all. But uh, you can see pictures of those. Documented, online, no explanation. And then, as we've chatted about before, they, you've got out-of-place artifacts. That's a keyword search. Out-of-place artifacts. Four words. Look those up on the Internet. There are footprints, for example, bare feet, walking through what would have been at the time wet sand, and today, millions of years later, the stone. These bare human footprints are not unusual, except for the fact that they're millions of years old, predating supposedly where you and I came from. Bare human footprints, just like your foot, just like mine, they're modern, but they're millions of years old. They're not caveman, they're not Neanderthal. But more than just the fact that they're just human footprints, is that they're side by side with dinosaur footprints, and they're side by side with the footprints of giant humans. Also, perfectly normal design for foot, except for the person, the human being who belongs to this foot, was like 14 feet tall. 
Now, my own people, the Hopi Indian, have legends about white men living in America when the Hopi came up out of the earth 10,000 years ago. Hopi legends say that we lived inside the crust of the earth in vast megacities, but that evil had come to our world, and so a holy man led a group of us to safety. He led us up to the mystical realm called the surface. And that's where we found white men with red hair and blue eyes living on the surface of the earth. Some of them were 14 feet tall, living in houses. And unfortunately, they considered uh, anybody not 14 foot tall an animal, and they were actually eating people. Sort of a problem there. A lot of the Native American tribes went to war with these 14 foot tall, blue eyed, red haired giants who were eating their people, actually hunted their women and their children. Um, I don't know a lot about that, but I do know that the Maori, when they arrived in New Zealand thousands of years ago, um, there are Maori stories of finding white people already living there with red hair and blue eyes, and uh, these fair-skinned, blue-eyed, red-haired people taught the Maori the art of reading and writing the arts the sciences. Now, New Zealand's an interesting place for a lot of reasons. The earth is very welcoming to people, but the natives are not. And apparently, and I don't understand how this is possible, and I can't verify it, so you'll have to look it up, but apparently there were no pollinating uh, insects of any kind, so all you basically had was forest and very few options for food. The dodo, for example, was basically the only meat source that the uh, Maori found at the time, so when the Maori ran out of uh, dodos to eat, they turned and ate their white teachers, because obviously they weren't Maori, therefore they weren't human. The Maori then went on to start warring against each other. And as we've chatted about before, whenever you have a, a tribal culture, the name of the tribe, no matter what it is, usually just gets down to the people, which means that anyone who's not part of your tribe is not people, and therefore you can eat them. And to this day in New Zealand, uh, I remember a taxi driver telling me this, it's my first Ma uh, Maori word, para para umu. And it's a city outside of Wellington. And the taxi driver was telling me the story that para para umu in Maori actually means dirty oven. And apparently what, what happened was, as the Maoris were at war with each other, clan against clan, uh, the women would go out into the battlefield and find enemy soldiers and drag them, whether they were alive or dead or not, and throw them into ovens to cook them as quickly as possible. And that's where the phrase uh, dirty oven came from, which I always found remarkable. It also explains why when uh, white men finally officially came to New Zealand, uh, they overwhelmed the Maori because they were too busy killing and eating each other to band together against a common enemy. So anyway, you hear these stories of great teachers, all white men, blue-eyed, red hair usually giants, all over the world. You find them in South America, you find them in China, you find them in New Zealand, you find them in North America. But all the same, white men with blue eyes and red hair. Just the other day, um, a tomb, quite a few uh, burial tombs were found in China. And they discovered 12-foot-tall humans with red hair, uh, still intact, obviously white, and even today, you can hear stories of flying witches in Mexico. Women, looking like our traditional concept of a witch, flying. They, they apparently don't use brooms, but they fly in Mexico. You hear endlessly these stories of winged reptile men, sometimes called moth men, I don't know why, in Florida. And of course, there's the world's all-time best legend, the Loch Ness Monster. Well, you know, my point is just this. If even one of these stories is true, even if just one of them is, it means that there's more to our world than we think. And there sure is hell a lot more to our world than we know. I mean, after all, the Earth has been around for billions of years. And man, the human race, you and me, has been there that long too. Because if you look up out-of-place artifacts, you'll find a listing for the 
human footprints thing, but this time it'll be human footprints wearing leather shoes, walking in what was at the time wet sand. And the imprints are so clear, you can actually look at the imprint. It's obviously a leather shoe, obviously human-made. You can even still see the stitching on the leather shoe. You could have worn them, I could have worn them. And that sand, that was wet sand, that's now rock today, it's billions of years old. Not millions of years, billions of years old. So you, me, our ancestors have been on this planet for billions of years. And if the planet flips every 32,000 years because a dead brown dwarf star passes through the plane of our solar system and flips us like a billiard ball, how many civilizations is that? How many times have we done this? So it's not out of the question that we, have, as human beings, in those billions of years have evolved in different ways, you know, down different evolutionary paths. I mean, the little people in Tennessee, the giants living on the plains of America, the white teachers in New Zealand. I mean, just in my own lifetime, for example, in Japan, uh, the diet of the average Japanese has changed dramatically. They've introduced the eating of red meat to Japan. So now, in the space of life, my lifetime, you've seen the Japanese going from a very petite people because they were basically eating rice, rice and fish. Now you see Japanese, in my lifetime, who are giants, who are like six, seven foot tall, just because of a change of diet. Now, if simply changing our diet changes our physiognomy, what if you lived in caves? What if you lived in the mountaintops and only eat lichen? I don't know. So cycle after cycle, event after event. People have gone into the crust of the earth to survive, and once they were there, probably found it a lot safer to live there than return to the surface of the earth, because, you know, there's scary memories. So what would you be like? Your children, your great-grandchildren, five generations after living inside of the crust of the earth. There are stories that if you reach the 5,000 foot depth in the crust of the earth, and I have no proof of this whatsoever, that there's a natural luminescence that begins. Many people talk about the hollow earth, and as Star Trekky as that sounds, it actually makes a lot more sense if you look at the universe as being electrical in nature, because our earth if you ping it with, say, a nuclear bomb, it rings like a bell. And the only thing that rings like a bell is something that's hollow. We have a magnetic field around our planet, and the only thing that would account for that is, well, it can't be a molten crust or a molten uh, core. I'll tell you that right now. Ask any um, electrical engineer to describe to you how can you have a ball with a magnetic charge. Well, it cannot have a molten core. It's got to have a solid core. There's also a belief that the Earth, there is no such thing as tectonic shift. There is the Earth is expanding. Because it is a fact that every that a trillion times a second, we get messages from the center of the galaxy. Energy is broadcast to us a trillion times a second. Information is passing through us. And if that's true, you and I are too brief in this universe to notice it, but our planet isn't. And people believe that that energy is being converted to matter, and that the Earth is actually expanding because of it. And because the Earth herself produces oil as a natural byproduct of her process, she also produces water and air. Where is the energy for that? Where's the mass for that coming from? It's got to come from somewhere. And so if you look at a globe of the Earth, it makes a lot more sense that the Earth is expanding. Because the continental drift theory just doesn't work. And again, uh, getting back to the Hopi, the Hopi lived in, the legend is, the Hopi lived in megacities in the crust of the Earth. God only knows how long. This is a story I'd like to hear more of. There just isn't that much to go on. But it's there. So even if one of these stories is even partially true, what else are we not knowing? 
you know, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that the folks who still live in the center of the world visit us once in a while. I mean, you know, go visit the folks, visit the relatives, just to come out and see what's going on for a holiday. And there are constant reports of dinosaurs, baby Tyrannosaurus rex, and pterodactyls. They're reported all over islands in the Pacific. They're even reported in uh, North America. Where are they living when we don't see them? They just sort of pop out of a cave and say hi and run back inside. That's kind of creepy. Then, just for the fun of it, do another keyword search on the internet and look up something called flying rods. R-O-D-S. Flying rods. Two words. It's amazing. Whatever flying rods are, they can fly through the air, they can fly through water, and they've even been photographed flying through space. They've actually buzzed the space shuttle, and they do that all the time. What is it? I haven't a clue. Haven't an idea. Have no idea at all. But look that up. It's a hoot. But it really gets down to so what? Who cares? Does, how does this help any of us today? How does it help you or me? You know, you ask yourself, will this get me my job back? Will this pay my mortgage? Will this put gas in my car? Will it feed my children? The answer is no, not today. But it does tell you something. It tells you that there is a way of living, a different way of life. There is a way to survive and there is a way to prosper. It tells you that if you start asking questions about things like this, you might actually get around asking a lot more basic questions that could help you. Where did the bank send my money that they stole from me? Why is my house being foreclosed on for no particular reason? Why can't I get a job just because I know how to do my job? Why are the politicians that I elect raping me? This isn't how it should be. So asking questions is always a good thing because eventually you might ask the questions that actually are important to you. How can I take my country back? How can I take my world back? How can I take my life back? Just remember, there are 300 million Americans. It's only a couple hundred masters. Maybe a few thousand mandarins and maybe a couple hundred thousand slaves, willing servants. We outnumber these creatures a million to one. 10 million to one worldwide. So maybe if you start asking questions about where we're from, where did we really come from, what's really happening around us, to go into the banker with your gun drawn and say, I want my money back and I want it back now. By the way, these are uh, 3 million of my closest friends and as you can see, we're all armed. We want our money back might be a good time to uh, start thinking about that. You're American citizens. You have the right under the Constitution to defend yourself against all enemies, foreign and domestic. You have that right. Read the U.S. Constitution. Read the Bill of Rights. It might actually remind you who you should be and not who you are. For all of us here at the 2012fad.com, this is Charlie Bluehawk, wishing you a really good day and reminding you, please, keep that one good thought. The 2012 Fad is brought to you by Coffee and Blood, Love Letters Between the Dead, a series of five erotica horror novels about a fallen angel finding his way back to regain his own soul and how the CIA war against the human race. Their black magic captures and traps him in the body of a mind-controlled slave designed to hunt down and to kill their god, their Satan.